like we're recording. Are we? Yeah, I've just hit record. So okay. what were you saying then? So, married, well, basically forces background, so wife, ex-Navy, former Navy. Um, so we got married in August 09. She flew out to Afghan October 09. Um, mum was having problems with alcoholism. Tried her mum? No, my mum. Um, my mum, so she tried taking her own life, um, intensive care, not likely to make it. So JCCC on Afghan, they got um, Herky Bird to, I don't know where it was, and then flew back to Exeter. Um, and then from Exeter, they got a Hilo to Barnstable Hospital. And the Hilo landed outside, in, outside the hospital as I was in the intensive care unit. With your mum? Yeah. Fucking hell. So. <laughs> I thought it was going to be a relaxed one today. <laughs> <laughs> we'll start off like that. So, <laughs> but she, you yeah, know, all, all good now, but I say that's, you know. We Your mum's all good. Yeah, yeah. But we say so we've discussed in the past, haven't we, because both, we both experienced parents with, with issues. Um, well, we'll talk about it. Cheers, mate. First off, cheers. cheers. Yeah. Well, Gav, Megan, I'll be back in the studio again. Again. Three, what, uh, three years ago. Was it? Well, in, yeah, three years, September. What, um, what number were you? Nine. I was after Johnny Mercer. Oh, that's another subject. <laughs> uh, number what? 19. Early. Early on. Mm. Do you know what you are? Do you know what number you are now? It's 130 or one. 130? Is it? Yeah, yeah, 130. Number 130. Not that I'm counting. Oh, that's a nice, that's a nice L. So, so, the chef, so Gav is a chef. Now, hang on a minute. I know you're not a chef here. You're not a chef. You st- you you started off trade in the navy as a chef, correct? I joined the navy as a chef, but I'd already been chef in in Civvy Street for two about two years. Um, okay, and yet today you've br- you've purchased pr- side piles is going to love this. You've inst- you've purchased you bought snacks, which I'm grateful for, very grateful, which you bought from a shop. Yep. Why didn't you make your own cheese? <laughs> Why did you buy cheese and not make it yourself? <laughs> well, it would have been good to bring some snacks you know, homemade, but um, such is life. Busy, um, easier to buy. Next, next time, rugby. For, well, rugby for heroes event. I just have to bring something homemade. One hundred percent. Yeah. All right. So what else we got? So you brought your. We got pork. We got beer. You got cheese, crackers, olives, snacks. Is that the aircon? I hope you can't hear that on there. One sec. Yes, yeah, fine. Um, and we've got Becky's brownies from Mike Valance. I remember them being. It's good. a real set for an emotional roller coaster. <laughs> it is, yeah. Right. So talk to me, mate. Well, uh, yeah, it's. I did. So I didn't realise that happened to your mother. What was what was the uh, what was your experience with alcoholism then? Um, looking back now, I think there was an underlying issue, even from the early years. So when. I was a teenager, um, obviously two brothers, well, three brothers, but um, two younger, one older. Um, but I think in, in the background, it must have been always there. Um, and I could look back now in hindsight, yeah, it, it, the signs were kind of there, but it was man- I think she was managing it. Um, and then when her relationship broke down with my stepdad, um, whilst I was away, um, deployed, um, I, I didn't quite realize how bad things had got until I got home. Um, and the family's supposed to go meet you from the ship, as they do. So your family's on the J. Um, they didn't make it to the J. Um, but luckily, obviously my mum and dad had separated. I had my dad fly out to um, board, no, Deportivo he flew out to. So he came back for the last couple of days on the ship. So I, I had family members there um, when when we came back alongside. But the m- mum wasn't there, brothers wasn't there. Um, and it wasn't until I got back home, s- seeing how bad it had got. Um, so yeah, then it, it was kind of like on on you know trying to get into to to you know stop drinking, but you know you go around the house and you'd find empty bottles or you find bottles hidden in places. They, they tell you to they're, they're trying to stop drinking or, or get help, and it was only after the the attempted suicide that um really help she she got help and and went to it's like a rehab kind of thing, but. Yeah, I, I, the worst part for me was um, the younger brother I had, and I think he must have been seven or eight at the time, was sitting him down, because when she was in ICU, said to me and my gran, um, she's not likely to make it. So I decided to sit my younger brother down and say, right, 
this he was aware obviously of, of the situation that basically you, you've got to say bye bye to your mum. Um, but she pulled through, you know, miraculously. Um, and now, yeah, she's a lot better now. Is that how she went dry? Yeah, pretty much. There was a couple, a couple of relapses. Um, but I think it's strange because looking back now and, and speaking to her, the doctors actually never kind of told her how serious it was. You know, she came out from ICU in a bad way, but didn't have any recollection of what happened. And the doctors didn't really tell her. And you get discharged and there's no like onward support kind of thing. Um, and also, yeah, it's not just my mum, obviously mum's battled addiction, but also my brother has as well. So, and he's, he's battled addiction with drugs since about the age of 13. when He started cannabis and then moved on to, to harder things. Um, and he's still having troubles now. And, you know, as much as they say a clean break, um, you know, on their own, you kind of try and still support them. But, um, and he's been in and out of prison which probably led me to why I, I became you know, so involved with Care After Combat because they deal with veterans in the prison system. Um, so, yeah. Are you the eldest? No, no. So the eldest is the one with a drug addiction. Um, I've got one young, another younger brother who's he's, he's okay. He works with my dad as a labourer. And then I've got another one who's just finished college, um, which is the one I had to kind of say. So there's, so there's four Tuac boys, is there? No, so three, three Tuac um, and one Mitchell. There's four of you, four lunatics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to be the sane, um, <laughs> what, head screwed on type of one. Um, Have you ever had any problems with addiction or anything like that? <laughs> I would, um, I think everyone that knows me, especially before I joined the Navy and even the first few years of joining, um, you know, I, I liked a beer, a drink. I'd never do anything stupid, as in I'd get to the point where I knew I'd enough and then disappear off home or, or to bed. Now, I've never as such been in trouble via drinking. Um, I'm more conscious of it now, if I'm honest. You know, we all grow up and we get a bit older and you can drink to mask your kind of emotions and problems. Um, I think you never really face up to them or, or understand what's gone on in the past unless you... You, you have that sober period or, or or just you know don't drink as heavily as you used to but during the navy when i i joined 2003 there was a there's a, a big drink culture then i think it's changed now and i think it's the same for probably both well for the tri services i think everything's changed now with technology and people just don't socialize like they used to um but yeah as we have another have a sip. That's cheers. Be, uh, yeah, cheers, mate. But yeah, it's, yeah, everyone deserves, everyone can have a drink, um, social drink, and yeah, now and then we have one too many, but you no know, one gets hurt and kind of know your limits. Um, so back to the question I asked in terms of uh, problems with um, addiction, alcohol then, at times. Yeah, I... I mate, if you don't want to go down this road, we no, don't no, have to, it's no, fine. No, so I, I... I don't want to make you... I never, I never sought help or anything like that. Um, but it would be, before I met my wife Hayley, um, especially when I joined the Navy at 18, I didn't go straight to sea. Um, so I was still able to come home weekends and, you know, fall into the routine of, of playing playing football, um, after football, straight in the pub, um, to early hours in the morning. And then you get up and then it'd be like, pub's over again midday Sunday, live, live football and live sport. And you wait for your friends to come meet you again. But by that point, you'd have a bottle of red wine and you'd, and you think, oh, I've got to, get, got to get back to work tonight as well. I've got, you know, back, you know, a full week of work. Um, but as you're younger, you can, you kind of manage it better. Um, I couldn't do hangovers now. I think you said before, if you have a massive blowout now, it just writes the rest of your week off. Um, well, do you know what I've realised recently? It depends what, well, which is like an obvious thing. It depends what you're drinking, obviously. But the pubs have obviously opened back up now, sitting outside. My God. Alcohol in the pub does a completely different thing to me than alcohol at home. Holy shit. Like I can <clears throat> I can I can put away a lot of beers of an evening if I want to on Friday or Saturday, a couple of bottles of wine, like a lot of beers, a lot of wine. I kinda mix my drinks and stuff like that. I don't generally have an issue the next day. I am still up my lying a little bit. We're talking like to eight o'clock maybe. I'm up and firing all four cylinders unless I drink whiskey and that's a different kettle of fish, right? But I went out 
like when the pubs opened back up the other week, I went out for a drink with the missus and I had maybe, I reckon I had, I reckon I had four or five pints, I reckon, and a glass of red wine. The next day, mate, I was a fucking write-off. All day, a write-off. All day. My head was wrecked. I, I just had a headache. I was just, it was just, you know, like, you, like a hideous hangover. Yeah. I haven't had that for a year and a half because the pubs ain't been home. Ain't been able to get on the piss. Um, and I didn't realise how different it is, though. The, 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 that draft compared to cans. The way they, they must be the way they process it or something. I don't know. Bizarre. What are you laughing at? <laughs> Just four or five pints and a glass of wine. You sure that's sure that's all you had? <laughs> yeah, I, I reckon it was. Maybe, maybe I don't know. Maybe six or seven pints. I don't know. Let's drink. But the point is, I, I could put away 10, 15 cans, for example, and maybe a and maybe a, a glass of wine of an evening sitting at home, which is a excessive, right? But the point is, I wouldn't the next day be written off. I'd be up. You're drinking in the sun, though. You know, in the sun. Getting dehydrated. No, 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 wrong. I suppose it's April. It was, now. It was eve- yeah, exactly. It was April. It was evening time, and I was under. It was under a. Ma- it was under a massive marquee. And it was freezing, so there you go. I don't know what point I was going with that. Um, yeah, you mentioned so that's so that is then your background experience with that stuff is how you how you, the fundraising and the charitable work came about. Then, how, why did your brother end up in jail? So to, to, to feed his habit, really. Um, so stealing, shoplifting. Um, the thing is, it, he's his character is so laid laid back, and that he, he, you know, growing up, and he was getting into trouble with owing drug dealers money and stuff, and that, and and getting beatings for it and stuff. And you know, we we see now we've seen that you know um, the bad states he got into from being being beaten up for owing money and stuff. Um, so. He'd steal on that, um, and that's obviously he ended up in, in prison. The, the, the latest one, he, I think he's just done two. He's outside now, uh, two and a bit years um, for, for trying to mug someone, you know, um, under the influence of drugs. And rightly so, he went to, went to prison, did his time, um, and back out. But when they get released from prison, there's no one would support either. He's yeah. If you do the crime, then you know you got to do the time. There's no there's no argument with that, and there's no excuses for it. Um, but there's so such so much reoffending. Um, you'd think to be onward support because the cost of reoffending is 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 mental. Um, I, no, I, 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 I haven't got the figures now, but yeah. No, but I know you. I know you from when you were with Care After Combat. Like this is you surprised me with some stuff you said back then when you were talking about this and 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 the huge proportion of people who do reoffend. But how much that can be reduced with onward support? Yeah, we were specifically talking about care after combat at the time. So go on. So what what should happen then? What do you think should happen? How should your brother be getting getting support then? Well, so he's released on parole anyway. So he breaks up parole. He goes back to, back to prison. But sometimes it's it's easier to go back to prison. Um, so they're going to break that parole. But he's really he got released back into the same area, for example. So he's known to have a drug habit. So dealers can easily target you again. So if you get released, and uh, and according to him, he he tried with his um his um the officer who's supposed to you know, oversee his release. They wanted to get released elsewhere, um, but but never managed. So he's he's back to where where the crime was committed. Everyone knows him, um, and they say he's been out for about eighteen months. Maybe possibly he might be out for two years now, and he's still he obviously he's not gone back. So he's he's, he's made improvements, but. Everyone knows he's an easy target as well, and that'd be the same for so many more. Um, so, what should happen? Get released into a different area, but have the support there. So, yeah, not saying everything's for everything comes for free, you know. But just give him you know, a job. There's job always been jobs available, um, whether it's you know, picking fruit or veg or anything, or you know, some kind of some kind of a apprenticeship, something to keep their mind occupied, I think. Um, you think offenders should have a right, it depends on the circumstances, should have a right to employment when they come out? To be given the chance. Maybe given the chance. Depends what the, what the crime is. Yeah, uh, that's and, true. Yeah. Um, but I think, yeah, everyone should be given the chance for employment because 
everyone will make a mistake somewhere. Some will be bigger than others. Um, but, you know, you've got the rest of your life to live, haven't you? If, if you commit a, a crime or um, in your 20s or even in your teens and that, and you live to the age of 70 or 80, you know, should you be punished for the rest of your life on, on, on some, some mistakes you make? And yeah, I, I can't make excuses for him. You know, what he did you know, is unforgivable. Um, but he's got to live the rest of his life with that and, and with the challenges it's going to bring because he, he, can't, he can't get a job at the minute. Um, and Why, What's stopping him getting a job at the moment? Because he's still got the addiction, I think. He's never, he's never really kicked the addiction. Um, so is he looking for jobs and trying for jobs? He has been, yeah, yeah. So job centre stuff and and is he get, he's getting them but not keeping them kind of thing. No, he's not. He's not been no. So he's not had a job since since. Yeah, um, I know. He, yeah, he, so the the thing is that when you talk about, I mean, I mean, just think about that question or that statement or the question: should should offenders be entitled to employment or? Should offenders have uh, be given maybe privileges or better access to employment? And you think like and the uh, like without having without having someone with your experience who actually knows and lives as a close family member and your experience and the impact of of their offence and their situation, their personal situation on on their life. It's 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 hard not to say <laughs> why should they get a better opportunity than me. As in the, per I'm someone who's a law-abiding citizen, but I understand that. But then on the on the opposite side of the view, it's like you in when you're in that position. I would I would imagine, and you would know, you will know this. I would imagine that it is nigh on impossible to get out. You need to change your circumstances. Um, I mean, the geographical circumstances that you're yeah. talking about is one example. And granted, that wouldn't work for everyone because. You know, if I think if you move to if you were to move your brother to a different area, you'd be then I'm assuming be then further away from his family, right? Mm -hmm. So he's further away from his closest support network, but he's also further away from the temptations. Yes, yeah, and the and the not nice people who are willing to um, uh, exploit him for their own profits. You know, yeah, yeah, drug dealers. Yeah, I mean, think it's not. Yeah, they, should have, they shouldn't be entitled any more than the next person, um, and we can, you know, that leads on, you know, can lead on to same as veterans, isn't it? Veterans shouldn't be any more entitled to a job than, than a civvy. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it comes under equal opportunity. Um, we, we all so much in, in the media now; everyone is equal, and, and, and we are. So therefore, it should apply to jobs. Um, if you've done done a crime and you, you've done the sentence, that is your so-called payback but it's supposed to be rehabilitation as well it's not it's not they don't even class it as a punishment anymore is it you go to prison for rehabilitation um and how much rehabilitation gets done i don't know I, with calf to combat i did a couple of prison visits to, to veteran wings and and this is even before covid um and they had all these different workshops that are supposed to be going on but none of them was and whether it's, i think it was just to do with staffing issues and that but always workshops that they, they could sign up to, to to better themselves, to put them in a, a better position for when they leave uh, prison. Um, they couldn't do because of, of staffing issues and the workshop's not open. Um, mm. so. the, uh, yeah, I mean, you could be as really, re at the moment, you could be as rehabilitated as you want within. If there's no support going forward, when you leave, your brother is a case in point, when you leave, you are disadvantaged. Yeah. So regardless of the crime, not regardless of the crime, if you've done the crime, You've done the time. You've been rehabilitated. You know, you're rehabilitated. You're, you're a different person. You understand the rights. So you're getting out. You genuinely, wanna, you genuinely want to make an effort for it, and then you're back in exactly the same circumstances as you were before, but worse than before. Because now you've got a criminal record. Now you, there's a stigma attached to you. People know you did this out of the other, and and yet there's no more support of it. Seemingly no more support available to you than it was before. But you're you're disadvantaged. Granted, you're disadvantaged because of your own your own doings. But as you said, even not when you're young, when you're older, you do stuff, which isn't a mistake, and you understand that mistake and you move forward, right? You shouldn't. I the, yeah, I agree with you, mate. It needs to be armored support. I mean, like we, you mentioned about craft combat, the focus on veterans, but there needs to be armored support for in general for for the um, for ex criminals, because why not? If you if you can improve the situation, it reduces 
the chance of reoffending reduces crime, which in, which reduces stress on services, which reduces the prison population, which in, in, increases the um, the quality of society, if you like. You know. Yeah. Cool. I was, I was, it was the um, the obviously he did, he did prison time for for murder, didn't he? During that terrorist attack in London, the one who who fought off the terrorists with a narwhal tusk. Uh, yeah, I, I bet he's employed somewhere. You know, he he took someone's life, but because he but that's right, was it murder? Wasn't yeah, he? yeah. Was it murder or manslaughter? I think it was murder. Well, yeah, murder or manslaughter, but. You know, he, he did his time, and he, he has has his regrets. And I think I've seen an interview or, or heard an interview that, you know, it, it, no matter what he does, it will never re- repay the debt for what you know, kind of what he did. But you know, he, he saved people's lives that day, um, and I bet he's not a burden to society now. Well, he wasn't that day, was he? Um, no, I agree. And it, but it shouldn't take that kind of public no, redemption no, no, to no. Be, uh, to to permit you to be a oh, I'm a right, I'm a right member of society yeah. now. But it goes back to that. I want support. What? Uh, what's the, the fuck was that? Sorry, Paul stand up. He, he's had his food. That's kids. Kid. Um, what is what change has been brought about in terms of armoured support for veterans? So, with Care After Combat, um, and I'm not obviously now an ambassador anymore. Um, I've left that position. They got obviously the mentor scheme. So, there's veterans. Mentor and veterans. So I think it's a, I think it's the final twelve months of the sentence, and up to twelve months after they get released, they have a point of contact that's a veteran, so they, you know, understand kind of our mentality or our, you know, or, or how how we how we are kind of thing. Um, so they're a point of contact, so they will help them with their transition period. So they will help them apply for jobs, or help them get housing, help well, you know just have a, just have a chat. Because um, some people, you know, some veterans will leave the pri- leave prison and have no, you know, there might be no family support or they might have no friends or you know, so they create that rela- that final twelve months of the sentence. They create that relationship with that their mentor, and then for the f- next twelve months, that'll be their point of contact to help them with based, you know, kind of anything. Um, but for that, you know, that's a, for twelve months. That's a a good time to you know get your house in order and and have that support. Um, and it's proven it, it works. It, um, you know, they got you know, it's proven evidence that that charity is working with what it sets out to do, um, and they got a good a good pool of volunteers um, that do the mentoring. Um, so, you know, should could you apply that in Civvy Street? I don't know. It's it's difficult, isn't it? Um, I suppose you could have a mentor as such, but well, could you apply what in Civvy Street? So the, the veteran the veterans mentoring veterans. Ah. So veterans in the prison system, and you be mentor your peer support is another veteran, because there's always that thing. Not all veterans, but some veterans will say, "No, you know, civilians would never understand." Kind of, not what people have been through, but we work in a different environment to many, you know, and in terms of banter, in terms of just you work, you know, institutionalized as well. Um, and just stuff like that. So I don't, I don't think it'd work. I think you could give a mentor, but I think it'd be hard to pair up. I don't think so. I don't think so. No, I think the the reason it works is it, the reason it's obvious that it works, it's just more obvious with the military community is it, it's not because they're from the, they're all from the military community. It's it's because they're from the same community. They've got a shared experience and you can find the same shared experience in anything. You're a man and I'm a man, (laughs) woman and a woman, nurse and a nurse. Uh, yeah. Police, police, fucking bricklayer and bricklayer. Bricklayer is out. Bricklayer is in Nick. Yeah, you yeah. know, you, yeah. you, you shared experience, common background, and all. And all that is is striking up talking points to break the ice. In reality, in reality, at the start, and then it's again you can relate to the same kind of experiences and learnings and knowledge and 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 you can form a bond that way, right? It's, which, it's, it's whichever grouping you want to make or need to make, you know. I'm convinced now. Yeah, <laughs> I'm convinced. Get... But it's like, yeah, <laughs> it's like, but why? Why can't that be? You know, something that. Well, perhaps, perhaps what a care after combat are doing 
is is the proof in the pudding demonstrate of this is how things can be done this works replicate it across other communities other industries other groups not for the benefit of industry industry specific specifically but for the benefit of society and the fucking prisoners so look, look we got you know we got a bunch there's a, there's a large proportion of of criminals have got a back guaranteed i've got a background in the construction industry for example you know um so let's look at pairing up mentoring construction industry with construction industry that is not impossible yeah yep sold this mate, <laughs> yeah this is the hr studio room of knowledge is what this is Every day's and i've only had one beer half a beer half a check beer. as i can there we are which one it is an interesting topic. The topic of, of, of prisoners and, and how and how and how they should be helped or not rehabilitated in society is, for some reason, it can be a, one that is it, it can be quite divisive. People have and people have very wildly different opinions. Like, fucking your fault. You did the crime. It's your fucking fault. If imagine that was you, and then ten years later, when you robbed the car, for example when you were 16 years old, because that's just how you grew up in the area you grew up in, and that's just when the shit you did. You robbed a car, you're 16 years old, and 10 years later, you've grown up, and you realize, and you're like, you were not that person. You were completely down the line. You did your time for it. You shouldn't still be penalized. There are people move on, and they grow, and, and people absolutely change. The saying, a leopard never changes its spots, is bullshit. It is bullshit. Absolutely can do. Yep. Absolutely can do. Well, it's us, uh Prison. Uh, <laughs> oh, you want to move on now? You want to move on now, dear? No, I, I think you know it, it's um it's a topic you, you go on and on, on about, and they say everyone will always have different views on you know it, on sentencing and, and everything. Um, but in my opinion, there should be support um, afterwards. You know, and cutting reoffending is in everyone's best interest, whether you, you like it or not. Um, yeah. In terms of the taxpayer and stuff and and whatnot, but um, so yeah, um, people 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 seem to support veterans in the prison system more than they do the civilians in the prison system. They seem yeah. to support them more. Yeah, they would do. Yeah, so a veteran in the prison system is is more su more supported to us, and or oh, he must be in prison because he experienced this in, in you know an operational tour and that. Not necessarily. You know, I I did a um, I did a um, a fundraiser in in uh, Winchester prison. Um, and there's veterans in, in there and that. And there's one, I think it was an Irish guard, you know, Irish guards? Um, and he was actually in prison for being in a big scrap in a pub. You know, and he'd only done a few years. He hadn't been on any operational tours and that. Um, and he'd been in a big scrap and, and got charged and, and, and sentenced kind of thing. But um, if you put him up, in my opinion, if you put him up against someone who was just a civvy and went into a massive punch-up and did some damage, I think the veteran would get more support from the... Civilian, well, as in, it's more sympathy, because they automatically think, right, he's serving on forces, therefore, stigma, I think, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, yeah, quite possibly. Anyway, that's quite possibly. The world according to me. <laughs> yeah. How do you, uh, how do you manage yourself? How, are you, you obviously, are, you're mega. Are, you probably like me mega conscious of um, what your family members experience um, and the afflictions that they are, that they face. Are you mega conscious of or worried about you being impacted by that? Because I think a lot, of the, a lot of the time these things are genetic. Oh, hang on, no. A lot of the times when you grow up so close to it, it is either genetic or it's just ingrained from you from a young age. For yeah. example, like, like alcohol for me is a, always on my mind and definitely, definitely it is, I, it is a it is a challenge to keep a control on it. I'll, I'll say that openly and honestly, you know, but I think it's easier for me to manage it because of my upbringing and being around the alcoholism. Yeah, because you know? you've probably seen firsthand, like I have, the, the damage it can do if you, do, you don't manage it. Well, um, like like your, you know, like your mum, um, well, my dad's been on the on the pocket. You know his story, yeah. you know, and, and so I asked about whether it was was that when she went dry when she ended up in ICU. Because for my dad, it was he went dry because he nearly died, yeah. and it was almost a forced initiation 
of going dry, cold yeah. turkey, because he was in hospital. Because he was fucking... Yeah. There's no alcohol in hospital, mate. And when you're, try, when you, when you're on death's door, you've got a choice and you weren't cold. I mean, cold turkey nearly fucking killed him. But that's what triggered it. Um, which is why I asked about it. But yeah. Talking about, the, the, obviously, I'll answer that question. So, um, the cold turkey thing. We had um, a chef. I won't mention what ship because um, basically they, they, they know the person. Um, but he was a he was, he was a serving chef and very big drinker. You know, always always drinking. Um, and the ship went dry for whatever reason. And um, th- th- he had obviously cold turkey, no alcohol available, proper you know withdrawal. Um, and the actual surgeon on board said to the captain, you have to give this man a beer or he will basically die, kind of thing. Die is probably a bit extreme, but they had, they had, and then obviously he got sorted out after that because I don't think they realised how bad his problem was until they took it away. Um, so, yeah. Well, die, uh, die isn't that extreme, mate. It's not. It's not that extreme. It fucking happens. It happens. Yeah, cold turkey. Yeah, mm. it happens. You know, if you're, if you're, well, if you were drinking that much alcohol, your your immune system's compromised anyway. Yeah. You were, you were severely compromised, and then you take that away, and your body's all all of a sudden got something that is completely dependent on to function. So you remove something that's completely dependent on the function, and your immune system's compromised. You fucking fucked. Why would a ship go dry? Out of interest. Give me give, give me scenarios. Um, you know the Royal Navy fascinates yeah. me. You're, you're yeah. strange creatures. So um, Stra- you're strange creatures who love abbreviations and yeah. acronyms. So a number of reasons. So it could be operational, um, operational reasons. Ship goes dry, or because it's high risk. Yeah, high risk. So you you, you closed up in a ready um, a state of readiness. So everyone's got to be on high alert. So traveling down the streets of hormones. You know, you, you know, pro- close proximity to land, missile attacks. So everyone goes dry. Um, beer fridges are locked. But it could be something as simple as someone's fucked up. Um, <laughs> I've been on a ship and 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 um, a mess president um, of the seniors mess, and we were on a beer ban, just our mess, because some people messed up. Um, yeah, so you on a beer ban for you know a month or two months, but uh, imposed by by the CEO, the captain. So, so yeah, so it could be yeah, operational, or it could be just someone's. Yeah, fucked up. It's, it's always it's been talking talk for years that all ships would be going dry because um, there's non smoking now, um, non smoking on ships. Um, you so. can't. So if you're on a ship, you can't smoke anywhere, anywhere. At the moment, that's how I believe it is. Yeah. So it used to, it used to be horrible. Um, I've never smoked, but when I first joined, so. Say the upper deck was out of bounds, or the quarter deck. So it's quarter decks are in enclosed space. Explain to me what those decks are. What do they do on those decks? So upper deck and quarter deck. What happens on those? So Remember, it, I know it, nothing. Like, so upper, upper deck is. I've never even been on a ship. I've been on a. I've been on. I've been on a submarine. I'm going to get you on a ship at some point. Oh, at some point. You sh- go on. Try to. Um, so upper deck is out on, out on fresh air. So that's on, on the ship's waist. So that's where kind of your upper, upper deck weapons are. Um, people could run around the upper deck. Upper deck, you know, flight deck. That's on the upper deck. So upper deck is. Anywhere on the outside. Oh, okay. Right, okay. Yeah. Um, quarter deck is after after end of the ship, which is below the flight deck. At the aft end. After the end, back the end. Back end. Yeah. yeah. So um, below the flight deck is the quarter deck. So that's like an enclosed space. So it's you know tools and shit. No um, winches and stuff. So when you know ship goes alongside ropes and chucked over. Gubbins. Yeah. Is it gubbin? <laughs> the gubbins. Yeah, yeah. Is that a navy term? Gubbins. I don't know. Where's that? Where's that? Jack? It's, a, it's, a, it's uh, Kate's. I need to bring it. Yeah. Oh, hang on. Is it? But go on. Keep talking. So, um, yes, yeah, so the quarter deck. So, when the upper deck was out of bounds, or the quarter deck was out of bounds due to the ships being, or to the sea state being quite high, um, you know, no one would be allowed outside. So the quarter deck would be out of bounds, upper deck out of bounds. But the smokers would then smoke in the gash compactor. Gash compactor is probably, oh, I'll probably say it's even smaller than this, the studio, and literally. So, as a young chef. When I used to work in the galley, you, you take your gash down to the gash compactor. You say gash, we rubbish. Rubbish, and you would unclip the watertight door. Yeah, so if there's a flood, it doesn't go into there. Um, and literally, a cloud of smoke would just come out because there would be twenty to thirty people in there just smoking away in the gash compactor. And that was the only place you could smoke on the ship. When when, when upper deck and quarter deck was out of bounds. 
So then, I think, I don't know what years are, the years are, but the quarter deck was then put out of bounds for smoking because it was known as a confined space. So the only place then you could smoke would be the upper deck. But the upper deck goes out of bounds quite often. Flying stations, um, rough weather, upper deck firing. So I'm pretty, I'm pretty certain now that uh, ships are smoke free. Good. At they sea. should be. At sea. Yeah, I'm, yeah. and I'm, and I'm not. That I'm serving Royal Navy, but I'm, sh- but I, I would not be of this opinion if I was serving. Make them fucking dry. Make them dry. I don't think like, well, we shouldn't even sell alcohol, mate. I don't I think alcohol should be banned. I'm, what are you laughing at? I do. I love alcohol, by the way. I love it. But I also think it should be banned. <laughs> this controversial opinion number one. Yeah. I ban it. Ban alcohol. Ban smoking. Why are we allowing it? With well, a different tangent. Taxes. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, what's, what's the original question? So, um, ingrained for me from an early age. Yeah. I, um, growing up, I, I was conscious that I was kind of looked at as the woman that had screwed on. Nothing kind of phased me. I just got on with it. Um, and then, you know, kind of relied upon in, in a way. Um, stayed out of trouble, did what I had to, had to do. Um, and I think now, at the age I'm now with, with kids and stuff as well, and now we're able to, everyone talks, not everyone, people talk about mental health a lot, a lot more openly, um, which is good. I think... I definitely had some challenges growing up, which I probably kept to myself. Um, what do you mean? You know, when you, you, know, you, you don't f- you don't feel as you should. You know, your mind is not quite with it. You you do you're doing your GCSEs and that, but at that age, you're you're thinking about other things. Um, having a beer, <laughs> even at the GCSE age, I'd I lived in a small small um, small village. Where did you grow up? So I grew up in Biddyford, um, but I lived for a few years in Appledore, which is a small fishing village just outside Billyford. Um, where, where, where are they, mate? Where are those places? I don't North know. Devon. Okay. Um, and there was a local pub just down, just down the road and, that, and, and, you know, I was 15 years old and I was working behind a bar sometimes, sometimes. you know, it's just, and being around, you know, just being around that environment, um, with people drinking and, and, and smoking and stuff and, and, you know, people say, well, where, you know, where's the parents? Well, I know where mum was. She was, in in the bar in the pub anyway as well, and she you know she's never been a bad I can never fault her for being a bad mum I can never do that because she was always there for us um, always no matter what. But you know being around alcohol from an early early age it probably does have a a different outlook to what I've, you know, like now. Um, so mm. looking looking yeah it's definitely an, alcohol's been ingrained on me from an early age. I'm conscious of it, like you are. If I didn't have have um, commitments, you know, a wife and two daughters, things could be a lot different. I think mm-hmm. things could be a lot different, um, badly different. Um, but I think drinking from a young age probably was the way that I dealt with my emotions and feelings. Yeah, I think it's different for different people. Um, so I, I'm, I know what you mean. Um, <clears throat> I know what you mean. Uh, Growing up, being around the smoking, being around the alcohol, but I think how that impacts you depends on who the role models are in your life. I think, and and the reason I say that is because my daughters, they, their grandparents have a pub. Um, they are at that pub all of the time because it's like you know it's 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 got accommodation there. It's like they live their grandparents live there and they've got a really close relationship with the grandparents. Um and my eldest is now sixteen. My youngest is twelve. And my eldest like if if for example someone was to offer her you know, she wanted a bottle of fruit cider on a Saturday evening, for example. Just for example, hypothetically speaking. Like that won't get finished. You'd be like, she'll have half a bottle she would have half the bottle, hypothetically speaking. She would have half the bottle and go to sleep and then that's it. If that was me at that age, I'm getting smashed because that's yeah. what was done. That's yeah. what was done. And so they're like, I mean, arguably, they're growing up in a similar environment minus, minus one thing. So they're growing up around alcohol. It's a pub, right? Around alcohol, maybe not so much as smoking. 
It's a lot less now than it was obviously when we were growing up. But the difference is the role models they got where where we're talking about alcohol, smoking, that kind of stuff, bad habits. They've got good. They're surrounded by good role models. Yeah. And 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 that's reassuring to me, you know. Um, and that's yeah. It's it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, funnily enough, my dad was the same. I was like, I think I, I've mentioned it before. I th- I feel really lucky to have had. It wasn't even a. I mean, it wasn't a bad experience when I was young having mm-hmm. parents with alcohol issues. Cause my mother did as well. Um, it wasn't a bad exp- like it wasn't bad like at the time because like you they were great i mean i can't fault my parents you know i wouldn't be the person i am today if it wasn't for them mm. and you think well, that's actually they, that's quite an achievement for them actually <laughs> for anyone really like we smashed the entire time and then and i'm raising a legend like me <laughs> <laughs> but no it's seriously it was it was later on as yeah. i got older that it became a real negative experience moving with that you know at times, occasionally with my mum, but with my dad, yeah. you know, uh, real negative experience. Just, just fucking horrendous. But you know, yeah. I, 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 you know, it's, we, we're lucky, mate. We're like we're truly yeah, lucky. Yeah. You think about people who grow up yeah. with alcoholic parents who are abusive, ver- like in all kinds of way, all kinds of abuse, from verbal through oh, yeah, sexual yeah. abuse, just horrendous, horrendous. Yeah, and 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 like in. And, and being embarrassed to have them as a parent because they're gobbing off at everyone, they're shouting, they're always getting in fights. They, you know, there are yeah. people, I know of people who grew up like that and we ain't, that, you know, no. we're very, very lucky. Very yeah. lucky. It's just, our parents were not. No. So my dad, I got a really close relationship with my dad and we go to the football now and we you know, do the hospitality days and he has a drink and now we will get literally smashed together and we'll, we'll have a, a, a good time in that, you know, and, um, you know, I've, I've referred to him sometimes. He's, he's my best mate because, yeah, you know, the joke is, oh, he's, he's just basically that's going to be me in thirty years time and that. But he hasn't got a problem with it. He likes a social drink. You know, he, COVID is flipping. He's like a, oh, like a lot of people, COVID because they obviously can't socialise. You know, because social life, you know, friends and, and family and stuff and that, and not being able to meet up or go to the, you know, watch the local local game and stuff like that. So it's a, a big impact on, on a lot of people. Um, we're both saying now, you know, we can't wait until we can catch a game of football together just to to make memories because say none of us are getting any younger. Um, you know, and, and a time will come when you know you have to choose. You know, daughters, I want to spend you know, all my time with them um, and, and and the wife as well um, because I say I, I'm not home all the time being in the service. Um, so I got yeah, you know, got to manage your time. I, I don't want to neglect any part of my family. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to catching up with me, me old man, um, for a drink or two. And yeah, I think you know, COVID's. Well, we're not going to go on. To, we won't, we're not going to go on on the COVID route. Well, what's it been like for you, impact wise? What have you? How, how has it been for you personally? The the, uh, the COVID thing, because it's, it's it's been such a wild variety of impacts on people. So I've been home more often, more often, which is good. You know the homeschooling and stuff, and and you know, the Royal Navy as as a whole has been, you know, fantastic in how they manage their people. Um, Go on, explain. Just they've, they've really adapted. So in in terms of um, the IT that was needed, so there's certain jobs you can work you can work from home. You know, if you're not in charge of, of a, a, a massive amount of people, um, and you can do your job remotely, as in from home, it was fully supported, and they've adapted to that, and and. A lot of people have, have worked from home and they were there for the homeschooling and stuff. And, you know, I've been in, in in certain meetings, which are quite, you know, important meetings. And, like, the, the officer running the meeting, a captain, will say, well, not just in my circumstances, but he will say it to the whole people involved in the meeting. If you are homeschooling as well at the minute, that will take priority to what what we are doing now. So, if you, you know, if you only have to be, if you can only be in the meeting for five minutes because you've got to do maths with your youngest or whatever... Then, then by all means, off the meeting, do what you have to do. So I think in terms of, yeah, the Navy's brilliant in that aspect. I, I can't see, obviously I can't comment on, on the other services, but I, I would like to think they've done the same. Um, and they've embraced it now. They've already said that moving forward, we won't go back to the way we were. Um, people will work from home more often. You know, if you haven't got to be in the office, 
you've even got to travel, you know, 400 mile round trip to go to a meeting, and you can do it over over a, a laptop, then do it over a laptop. I was about to ask. I was about to ask. Yeah, I was about to ask that question. The, the pandemic is a watershed moment for business, I think. Yeah. Um, and certainly in terms of the ways and methods of working, and I know it is for where I work in Marsat. You know, bef- I think before I, before uh, before the pandemic, when I was working, there, I'd only been there a short time before the pandemic, but um, the norm was working in the office, and in exception, you would work from home. That, like that was in, as in permanent home worker kind of thing, mm-hmm. and now that's changing through. No, no, no. It's like more broadly, you either in the office, you like, you either in the office permanently. That's one type of contract, for example, in terms of where you work. Then the other part is you're in the office partially, a couple of days a week maybe, and the other type is full blown home worker. And that's going to be the same for a lot of a lot of businesses, and rightly so. It's good. It's so this is the thing with the pandemic. It is. It is advanced changes that were coming about anyway. It's just made and brought about much, much, much quicker. Maybe for the benefit in some areas, maybe for negative impact in some areas. But mm, you indicating there, you think that is going to carry into the navy, as in those changes in practice and procedures, which I can kind of see that would be that would be achievable in, in the navy. I don't know if I could see it would be done in the army. I don't just it's, it's, it's because the army is like an old, you know, it's like it's like the. the <laughs> It was stuck, not stuck in a ways, but it's. Uh, you can. This, this, uh, you can play. Arguably, there was much more of a requirement for that in person, physical. I mean, generally across the board. In personal, in personal, in person, physical, interpersonal relations, connections, communication, generally. Oh, yeah, I suppose. Duty, Maybe not in the agile. Yeah, I suppose it, duty, of call, um, duty, of call, duty of care as well, I suppose, if, if you've got, uh, you know, a battalion or something with a lot of, a lot of youngsters in it um, they can't work from home can they really a, a private in the army he can't work from home can he well it depends on oh, the unit it, mate well, I suppose yeah but if it's infantry I don't know a lot about no. the army but well no, no. Is that, yeah? it, it, well infantry no it all, example. Yeah, they all get the adjutant's general's corps admin and money yeah, and stuff yeah. like that why not yeah. why not why do I have to walk into an office to go and see the pay clerk, so if I'm a you know whatever whatever rank in in the infantry or whatever, I have to walk into the office to see the pay clerk for a pay discrepancy or pay. Well, what can I claim? You, you get that you know, as well. What, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> why? <laughs> yeah, I used to. Yeah. Why do I have to do that? Why can't I? Why can't I just? Well, you can email, I suppose. But man, again, I just want to caveat this with: I've been out for ten years now, so I may be talking shit, right? But. Hmm, interest can't see it happening. It'd be good if it did. The problem, one of the misconceptions is though, with employers who don't really understand it, is they think, oh, it's going to be a lot cheaper if I make ev- and easier if I make everyone home workers, not realizing the implications. I'm going to tap into my health and safety background now, which I like to do from time to time to show how much of a flipping Ken Barlow I used to be, or I am, right? Um, used to be health and safety manager, you know, corporate health and safety manager. Important, big, important like, job. Yeah. It is an important job, and work. I used to love it, right? Do you know why I used to love it? Because it was such a ch- because the challenge is, how do you get people to pay attention to the health and safety manager? How do you get people to do it? It's like impossible task. It's the art of manipulation. I'm going to manipulate the employees to do what I need them to do. It's like and, it, and health and safety has to be the hardest fucking subject. It has to be the hardest thing, but absolutely valid. Because if you got Oh my God! I'm got, I'm got, this is I'm barlowing you, right? But I'm barlowing, right? But I'm but if you if you've got a good health and safety manager who is good at making the health and safety and welfare of the company uh, 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 progress positively, increasingly better, and the and the employees value that, the employees are more productive, and therefore the company is more efficient and ultimately more profitable. Okay, listen, I'm not free for hire at the minute. I've got a job. Okay, I'm just <laughs> saying to anyone out there thinking I've got to hire this guy. I've got a job. I'm happy. However, <laughs> hook up with me on LinkedIn just in case. <laughs> you never know what's going. On. LinkedIn, you said it's more like Facebook now. Uh, oh, it's bollocks. Isn't it? Anyway, we, uh, we yeah. got into this. So what was I saying? Oh, health and safety. Oh, no, they got into no, that. No, we got into, oh, we but, oh, here's an example. Oh, yeah, I'm going to have people I work from home. Well, you, you work from home, guess what? Your employer is your employer is obliged to provide you with the proper equipment and tools and whatever it is that you need to 
to work from home in the way that the health and safety yeah. executive dictates. That means, okay, that means that... I'll never hear. Uh, no, so like an example in uh, at home uh, in the office, when you go to an office chair, the display screen equipment regulations, right? Five casters in the thing. You have to have armrests. You have to have wrist supports. You have to have adjustable back and adjustable height. All that. That's what you need, right? If you haven't got that at home, your apply your employer is obliged to provide that to you. Mm -hmm. If you can't work comfortably, if you can't work in a way that does not um, increase the risk of like chronic fatigue, chronic injuries, which are absolutely real, by the way, because I experienced yeah. it hideous in my neck um and they're obliged to do that and that is a lot of money a decent office chair is not a tenner no. off a of flipping facebook okay. you're talking up to 100 quid you know uh, but that's the point anyway christ almighty sorry if anyone's switched off yeah Go on. Help them safely. no i think yeah we just got um in terms of adapting to the to the covid that i say home a lot more good because i i a, ch a chance to spend more time with, with my daughters and, and, and wife and did the homeschooling homeschooling was a challenge i'm not going to you know, how, not, old not how old are your kids? Six and four. So, oh, so God. four year old, not so much because you know the kind of task they were given was, you know, it's not not learning. But six year old, not you know, you understand what they're asking um, in terms of what the school's asking you to help uh, help them help them learn. But you don't know the techniques. You know, you're not mm. you're not a qualified teacher. The techniques and that, and you, you know you're doing your best. Um, but it just seems like you've put, you know, it's just a pressured situation kind of thing. Cause you don't want your child falling behind. Um, and I've come across people um, that didn't do any homeschooling with their children. And it's like, how can you not do anything? Because they will, you know, they're going to fall behind whether we, we like it or not kind of thing. And, and it's not a case of trying to panic about it or, or, or give them excuses for, for the future, saying, oh, the reason you you know you're off school for six seven months that's the reason why you can't get a job because that's not going to be the case. But um, yeah, it was just it was a, I felt homeschooling rewarding because you can see how they're getting on. But it was def definitely felt pressure as well, pressure personally, but also you pre pressure on on your daughter because um, you want them to do the best best that they can and. Yeah, just you can go to school. I don't know how, what your school was like. Going to school to learn, going to school to learn at a young age was fun, wasn't it? Cause you're learning with your with your oppos or your friends, and that it, it's fun to learn at a young age. And it's not fun to learn when your mum and dad's saying, "All right, this is this is how you do this. This is how you do this." Oh, they don't do it that way at school. Well, this is how I was taught. You know, we were taught age away twenty five years ago. No, not not as much, but yeah. So different techniques. So, so yeah. So it's good to be home and, and and spend time with them. And and I think the first lockdown, it was it felt a bit like a holiday anyway, didn't it? In a way, I think nice weather, you know, out in the garden and stuff. And it's a bit all bit a bit new to everyone. Um, and people just spend more time at home. But then the flip side of that is, um, they get used to you being home. And so I, I work away during the week, and then come back at weekends, um, and then go back up, you know, back in. But it's getting back into that routine again. Um, and, you know, the kids adapt to that as well now. And I think, you know, the wife's happy for her own space again, you know. But she understands more than anyone because she's, say, former Navy anyway. So, um, yeah, adapting. How did your kids How did your kids respond to the homeschooling? My, my, my reason I ask is my youngest, so um, not the homeschooling. It's different for me. My kids are older than yours. They'll both be in secondary school. Uh, my my youngest is in her first year of secondary school, starting in September, like starting during the pandemic. Mm. I bet the youngest oh, definitely experienced a, a real decline in, I think so, a decline in her academic ability of being off, just while she's off, and needed to get back to school, like 100%. Just she responded better by being in the classroom. And then my eldest opposite kettle of fish i mean they might disagree with me right this is my perception of it my eldest as as command flourished absolutely flourished academically during the pandemic i think struggling the first lockdown and then since november december man just you know real improvements everywhere it's been really good um uh and which was important which is important yeah. because she's in the gcse year yeah 
yeah. you know, so she's, she almost, it's interesting, different people, isn't it? She, she, super disciplined, not like I was when I was a kid. She like, she'd be home studying Saturday, mate, Saturday, get up, studying Saturday night, or Sunday night, Friday night after school, studying like, oh my God, she would never have done that if she was still in school and the pandemic oh, yeah. hadn't, I don't think she would have anyway. It just, it's changed habits and behaviors, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And for me, like I asked you earlier, what's the pandemic been like for you? Mate, for me, the pandemic has been fucking brilliant. Like, I, I, like, I, I really feel that people have lost their jobs, lost their livelihood, and their, like, their world has been turned upside down. I really feel for it. Um, it's, 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 it is, it's horrendous, and that is a lot of people. Um, but it couldn't have been any, any better for me in terms of forcing me to be, to focus on being disciplined and really, um, again, personally, just living better, yeah. be more disciplined, less bad habits, um, understanding more what I want, where I want to be, um, what I need to do to just be content, right? Yeah. Um, I'm glad for that. But again, I, so I wish I, I wish it hadn't taken the pandemic for me to achieve that because yeah. it's impacted so many other people. Yeah. You know, nightmare. Yeah. Did, did the Navy have any redundancy? Make many redundancies or anything like that? Um, no, no redundancies. I don't think there's been any redundancy since when was the SDSR? 2008 was it? 2009. 2008, 2009, the, the big one when he made a lot of people redundant on it, I think. I think so. Um, when he cut, he cut ships and manpower. And then um, the Navy, well, especially for our, our logistics branch, he went, well, we need to cut, this is just, I don't know what the numbers were, we need to cut a thousand people, so we're going to do it the fastest possible. So there's a thousand people gone, and then realised, oh, natural wastage. Oh, shit, we're in a bit of a manning crisis now. What happened with the army? Yeah, it's just, the army. And uh, it was like it was, I think it was high officer level. Right, we want to do. I think, it, I, and it might not be true, but I heard him saying, right, we've got to cut so many people. So is the army. We'll cut ours the quickest. Like a competition against, you know, different services. And, but you know, that's what I heard. Um, not saying it's true. It was, <laughs> it was yeah. That's it was what, like, yeah, you know, I'm still. I yeah, it. I'm still. I heard, I heard it in the in the in the gash. Yeah, still. The, what is it called? The gash what? The, the gash compactor. Yeah, yeah. Don't let the truth get in the way of a good day. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, um, I say I'm still employed by the Navy. So, um, but <laughs> but the officer did all the redundancies. No doubt he's um, he's definitely gone. Um, <laughs> probably sacked um, or promoted actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's uh, one of the funny things. Um, if you do a massive, massive balls up, you um, get promoted out of it. Um, was it the um, it was the navigating officer or the, uh, on the um, it wasn't Nottingham, was it? HMS Nottingham. They run aground on in off, off the coast of Australia. Was it Devil's Devil's Rock? I think it was Devil's Rock. I'll, I'll get I'll get um, corrected if not. And um, proper. They thought the ship was going. The ship was going to sink. It was that bad. Proper, you know. It's, you look on you Google and look at the pictures online. Lost a lot of compartments, um, and uh, I'm pretty sure they promoted the navigating officer. I don't think it was his fault as such. It must have been. I don't know. But it, someone got promoted out of it just to get him out of the sh not out of the ship. But yeah, that was. I think I can't remember what year that was. Early 2000s, late 1999, mm. was it? Something like that. Um, yeah. Question for you: What happened? Why did so? How did the journey from Claire after combat to Hidden Warriors CIC? How does this come about? So I don't, because I'm honest, mate. I don't completely. Well, yeah, I don't completely understand it all. Brief me up. Yeah, I kept it. I kept it fairly quiet, really, because. So, my first fundraising with with um, Claire after combat was. 20, 2013, 2014, I think it was. So it was my first interaction with him. Uh, Jim Davison came aboard our ship. I was the charity rep on the ship. And um, I said, yeah, it was a new charity. We're, we're fundraising for you. So that's my, how it started. Um, and then we did um, a few other fundraisers, quite big ones, raised quite a lot of money. Appointed an ambassador in 2018, 2019. My years get mixed up. 2018 it would have been, um, ambassador, um, all good, all good stuff, still doing fundraising for him. Um, late 2019 put on a, a fundraiser which involved Jim, um, down at the 
the Crown Plaza in Plymouth. Um, a few heated words were exchanged. Um, well, prior to that, a few heated words were exchanged anyway. A what few, was the a issue? Few times. So the issue that night was um, he turned up and he, he was in a shitty mood anyway for one reason or another and he, he wasn't happy with the PA system. And he's, a, he's a, obviously a professional. He, he knows his he's stuff. An he's yeah, an entertainer. He's an entertainer. But he knows his stuff. Yeah. But he was involved from, from the, the time, with, you know, the day we booked it. So, right, this is the PA system we got. Are you happy with it? Well, if it does, it just does that. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so he got there, didn't like it and a few words with a few crosswords between us were said he was like well I'm not I'm not doing it tonight I'm not doing it and, and went off to his room and that fine um, now how do we get out of this how do we tell the 200 people turning up that Jim Davidson's not there and whatnot? so eventually he he got a, a, a PA company in with lights and all that stuff and that and I must stress that he, he paid for it out of his own pocket so it didn't come out of the charities um, you know charities money or or um the funds raised, so he paid for it out of his own pocket, and that, and, and he, he did a good job on the night. And you know, when he was doing his um his brief in the evening, you know, thanking everyone to come and that, he, he kind of mentioned, uh, you wouldn't have believed it, like three o'clock this afternoon, me, me and Gav was almost um at punches, and I, and it was never that, you know, we're never that close together to do that or anything. It would never have gone to that, but it was a case of, you know, I can't keep on doing this. He, he offended. A few people that day, staff-wise, and and it was like, why, why am I putting myself under this pressure? And I had family coming that night. I had my old, old man and stepmom and, and a, a few of their friends, and my wife was there as well. And they could see that I wasn't quite. Yeah, you know, I wanted to enjoy the night as well. You know, it's a lot of work into planning it, um, and it was a good night. Um, but I didn't really enjoy it probably as much as I should have done because of the, the build-up to it. Um, so I thought, well, I'm, I'm, no, no, no knee-jerk reaction. A few of the staff at Care After Combat kind of knew I was, you know, stepping aside. I thought, well, I won't do anything before Christmas. Um, and I had a think over Christmas. Well, if I do step down, I, I, need, I want something to not occupy my time because even if Hidden Warriors wasn't, you know, I've got enough to occupy my time. And I kind of need to manage my time better. You know, I've got a family. I've got a job. Um, but I, I still wanted to, to support in some way. From my own experiences with, with um, obviously my brother and my mum, but I think we, we, we're all in a position where we can help people. Um, and things just in my nature. Um, so Hidden Warriors was thought up, my wife knew about it. Um, and so did, did, did Mark, a good friend of mine, Mark Ray, who did help for some fun reason as well um, with Care After Combat. So we spoke about it. So I performed as a community interest company because around that time, well, 2019, there was a lot of um, a lot of negative. Charities, yeah, were, getting num- charities yeah. were getting a shit thrown yeah. at them, weren't they? And oh. some of them rightly so, others not. But there's a lot. Of, there was yeah. a lot of big spotlight on charities, isn't it? Yeah, and even, it has been ever since, actually. Yeah, but even now, it's, oh, there's over 2,000 military charities. Oh, there's still there's still veterans in need, and and as veterans that need support and. It's going to be. Uh, uh, it's going to be a veteran. It is going to be a veteran in support, even if you had five million charities and yeah. they were all the best in the world at what they did. There's still going to be a veteran support. Yeah. There is always going to be vi- veteran suicides. That is not me dismissing it. I just want to stress this. That is not me dismissing veteran suicides. Okay. The the uh, the support of veterans needs to be improved. The veteran suicide rate needs to come down 100. percent But you can never bring these things. You can never make the, the suicide rate zero. You can never make the support to veterans 100 percent available for everybody. It's not the way it works. It's no. not the way it works. And if you, if anyone says it to you different, or anyone posts any shit online that is different, for, I'm, I'm talking to people now, not Gav. They are talking absolute rubbish. Got out of my system. Come on, Gav. Glad you said it. So, yeah, so <laughs> Format is a, a community interest company first. Um, and we've run it for two years as a community interest company. And if it goes well and we're supporting people, then there is a need because people are coming to us for support. And that that is happening now. You know, um, no doubt of our first year, um, no doubt the COVID pandemic helped the numbers, but we, we helped over 150 families in our first year. Um, and this year we've we've about 30, 30 odd families so far and what we I wanted to do and this was something when I was with Care After Combat I was like well I know there's support there for, for the veteran you know there's a lot of support there for the veteran 
available if, if they want it, if it goes to the right place, or if, or if that, that charity is got their best interests, you know, best, you know, best intentions. But I was looking at more at the, the family, you know, the spouses, the children. So, fine, the veteran needs support. Give that veteran support, whatever it might need, mental health, financial, um, disability, you know, medical. But there will always be an impact onto that spouse or the, ch or the children, especially. You know, it, if a child sees their mum or dad struggling, don't think it's not going to have an impact on that child. It is. So Hidden Warriors was set up to focus primarily on the spouses and children of UK Armed Forces veterans. But didn't want to go down the entitlement thing because I don't believe in entitlement and there will always be entitlement for some people. What do you, mean, what do you mean you don't believe so, in entitlement? So the whole thing with <clears throat> I'm a veteran, I'm entitled and this could cause, you know, I, I don't think, I don't, uh, it's probably minimum that I'm a veteran, I'm entitled. When you joined the forces, you made that decision yourself. You possibly didn't know possibly didn't know what you were going to get into and and the reason you need support is because you wasn't looked after properly that's that's different um but there is and and because we work closely with other charities and that there's there is some that will keep coming back keep coming back and not helping themselves or want to help themselves because you will keep on giving and giving and giving um and that's that's minimum so we do that's on the that's on the responsibility of the charity, though. Yes. If that's the expectation of the of the beneficiary, oh, yeah. Then, for a large part, anyway, yeah. it's on the. It, that's expectation management on the part of the charity. Yeah. Uh, but then again, sorry, I'm just checking myself before I wreck myself. But then again, <laughs> oh, how would you tell someone who thinks they need more of whatever it is or want more of whatever it is you're providing them? But you don't. But you think they can get it from somewhere else? How do you tell them no while still remaining well, charitable? Well, we've we've not said no to anyone. That's, we um, we won't. I haven't said no to anyone. Um, oh, sorry, I wasn't. I, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was. I didn't. Want, yeah. I wasn't specifically talking no, about Hidden Warriors. No. No. So <laughs> we won't say no to anyone, and we are quite quick at what we do in terms of support. Um, you know, there's no massive questionnaire or stuff like that. We want to get support you as best possible means and quickest possible means. The bigger charities, there's a the bigger charities, there's a lot of hoops you got to jump through before you get support. Um, and the, at the end of jumping through them hoops, they might say you mean financial support, yeah. or f yeah, or financial support, any support. And when you jump through all them hoops and answer all them questions, oh, they still as might, a yeah, 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 right, sorry, sorry, they still might say no after you flipping proper gone to town on, on explaining why you need support. We don't do that, you know. It, we will support you. Come to us for support. We will support you in the best possible means. If we can't. We work quite closely with other smaller, I say small, good charities. So we've, we've worked with Safa in the in the Midlands, um, the case workers of Safa quite well, especially over the Christmas period. Um, the veterans charity we've affiliated with, which are based down in North Devon, and also the Button charity, which is small, Allen Row, um, down in Exmouth. So if we can't, we we kind of we will pat. We're not. Obviously, with your permission, we'll pass your details to someone that could help. It's not a case of no, we can't help. We can you know jog on, try somewhere else. We will try and put you in the best possible place. So, back to the entitlement thing is, um, yes, we've set up for children and spouses of UK Armed Forces, but on our website it says we will help other families on a case by case basis. Because if there's a child at school, a family that's struggling, child going to school, and they haven't got the right uniform, or they're looking shoes are falling apart, or there's a problem. You know, is alcohol in the family? Um, it's affected the children. You know, can we take the pressure off by involving them in a sports club, for example? So non-veteran families. Yeah. Normally. Okay. Yes, yeah, so on a case by case basis. If we have the funds, then we will, we will help other families on a case by case basis. For example, the whole COVID pandemic, when the schools first shut, and there were children. Well, even before the school shut, the children were shielding, so the children might have a, you know, whatever problems or anything, or the parents might set the shield and in lockdown. We were giving out activity bags for the children, so to keep, keep them, you know, everything was new to them, wasn't it? You know, school show, I can't go to school, I can't see my friends, I can't do this, I can't do that. So we did um, over 100 activity bags 
targeted at children. Now, what, what were they? What were they? So it'd be like arts and crafts, reading books, colourings, obviously a few you know, nice things like sweets and chocolate and stuff like that, and pens, pencils, all, that, all the sort of stuff that young children need, and they can just sit at a table and just you know crack on and, and take their mind off things for a bit, and even just give the, the parents a bit of a break because it was all new to us as well, um, and new to to parents and. Basically, the same on a case-by-case basis for non-veteran families is also because I wouldn't have felt right, especially during the COVID pandemic. We have 50 families of veterans, 50 families that are non-veteran. Oh, we're going to help these because they're veteran, but I'm not going to help these. The children don't know any different, do they? The children don't care if, you, if, you're, if you've been serving armed forces or if you're a fucking bartender. You know, so we, our focus is primarily on, on the children because... You know, they were saying is they are our, our future. Um, children shouldn't have to sh- shouldn't have to suffer. Um, and whilst we still help needlessly, yeah, need, yeah, <laughs> and, and 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 still while we, you know, we might we have supported veterans that don't obviously have children or don't live with the children, but we still support the veteran as well. You know, we not we don't say no just because you don't live with your your children and that. And You're primarily. Veteran supporting, but look, if you've got capacity, yeah. you'll support people yeah. who need support. Yeah, yeah. And I think... Mega. Yeah. I think I need to rein myself in sometimes because I want to help fucking everyone. And yeah, that's why... I, yeah. Um, so run it for two years as a community interest company. If things are going well, then we will change it into a charity. Um, and back to the thing, well, fucking hell, there's enough fucking charities and that. Um, we had a good, a good conversation with with a veteran, um, and we'll mention any names again that uh, has has a kid. Um, and they're saying what you do is quite unique because the support that is out there for veterans charity um, for for veterans children is there when someone's died or suicide. It's not when it's not as such when they're living and going through certain times. So and that's the key, mate. That is the key. Um, is that it's like business, okay? And you, you, know, you know my views on charity and business. You need to run a charity like a business. The difference is what you do with, you, what you do with uh, in inverted commas profits. Yeah. In a bit, yeah, they have to be run the same way. They have to be run the mm-hmm. same way. Um, but there's the key. There's what you said is if you are if you were thinking about setting up a charity. The first question you ask yourself is, is there a need for it? Am I plugging a gap? Yep. You need to plug a gap. And that gap could be something else. Isn't There is something else there. Are other charities that do what I'm thinking about setting up, but they ain't doing it properly. So I want to do one that does it properly, and that's fair enough. It's going to be difficult. You know, are you really providing... It, 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 that's hard. That's a hard task, yeah. right? But like you, you pl- there is an actual gap. In, in support available for beneficiaries in this area. And you're plugging that gap, and it's, it's mega. It is mega. Why is it called Hidden, Hidden Warriors? I think, well, Hidden um, is because they are they're not the main focus. So they will go about um, any situation or circumstances. They just deal with it and, and crack on. It's not, they're not known. As in, so... And the warrior is the thing, obviously, you know, um, a warrior is, is someone that deals with struggle and conflict. Um, and so children are, in my opinion, you know, if, if someone, if the parent's got a problem, the focus isn't necessarily the children. So they're hidden, but they're a warrior because they're just cracking on. Cracking on. Um, maybe, maybe a bit like I did. The, the, um, Hayley, my wife, kind of like, came up with the, the warrior kind of thing because... We said about um, I think hidden heroes was was the, fir- the first one for well, hidden heroes. The hero gets bound around a lot, kind of thing. So I'm glad we um, we went to the hidden warriors, and then the the warriors, I'll quote, warriors walk among us. Um, we had a, a a list of like what are we gonna have as as our kind of strap line, kind of thing, and that was the one that, um, was chosen, and I think it works quite well. Um, so yeah, it's um, it's going well. Um, yeah, I, I, the fundraiser's are going well. So I've done a lot of fundraising myself. Um, 
people are starting now thinking, oh, I'm going to fundraise for, for them now, which is good. That's good. And I've had messages of, of strangers on, on Instagram and, and fa- um, not, not Facebook, um, Twitter, liking what we do. And I just wanted to be completely transparent from, from the start because going back to when, oh, there's only there's so many thousand charities kind of thing, oh, there's this and that. And I said, right, this is the fun reason. This is what we get in. And our first annual accounts have just been just been finalised, which will be uploaded to companies else, which everyone can take a look at. And you can follow any questions at me as much as they want because I know we are absolutely in bulletproof. But don't stress about that. No, I don't. I hope you don't. But, but I, I hope did, you don't at, stress about that. At the beginning, I did. Because... Yeah, but you... But, but I know why. Because... Of certain people, yeah. Well, well, not, not, not certain, not people, certain but people, but we we have, as in the royal we, me, you, some others, and, and people are sort of aware of the stigma against religious charities at the moment. Is that we, we are, because of that, we focus in on the negative aspects. So we see the negative stuff being said about them. That's why you've got that. Don't stress about it. It's like, the way I think about, it, the way I think about things is, if you, if you were doing things honestly and with good intent, and and transparently, then don't stress about what people yeah. are going to think when they read into it. Just you do things within the le- letter of the law, yeah. and and do what you say you're going to do. Or if you think you need, to, you never know, mate. The direction of hidden warriors or the intent may change at some point, right? And that's fine as long as you communicate that and the reasons why. Yeah. Because yeah. what's your position? Uh, what's your position with the company? So founder and director. Oh and God. Then. Yeah. So. Oh my God. But you yeah, know why I'm saying that, don't you? Why is that? I, I messaged. Uh, so you know, Rich Rich Sharp is he stepped aside from uh, React Response. I didn't know he stepped aside. Yeah, yesterday. Yeah. Yesterday. Okay. He, he put he put it online. Um, so Rich Sharp, he he set up. Well, he was one of. The, no, he was one of the. He was a CEO of uh, Team Rubicon UK, which became React Response. Um, three and a half years, mate. I've had the most incredible impact overseas and now in the UK through through the pandemic. Unbelievable, mate. Unbelievable. Unbelievable organisations. And he said yesterday, step aside. And I dropped him a message because I, I genuinely respect the guy. He may be a Royal Marine, right? Officer as well. But I respect the guy and what he's achieved and stuff that he's been through uh, during his tenure. And a message was said, uh, you know, good job, you know, like blah, 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 blah. Um, I said, this, this, in, in my opinion, you know, this, this, being, a, being a director of a CEO of a company or of any organization is extremely difficult. I don't think people appreciate it. People see, oh, top of the tree, easy peasy, boss people around, get loads of money. Obviously, it's not the case in charities, right? But that's a difficult job, okay, to be a CEO of a company. There's only one equivalent job harder than that, and that is the CEO or the senior person within a charity. If you offered me a million bucks to go and become a, an MD, a director, a CEO, or it wouldn't happen, or a CEO of a charity. You know what I would say? Well, if it was a million, I'd be like, oh, I was going to leave. No, but I, in all seriousness, I, whew, no way on the face of this planet do I ever want that pressure. The pressure and the challenge that you've got. You don't, you don't sell a product. You know, you need, you need money to keep your ticket over mm-hmm. to provide a benefit, right? You're not provided, providing a benefit to customers. You're providing a benefit to beneficiaries. They don't pay you for that service. No, you no. give it to them for free. Yeah. And you have to get your money through the kind, heart, kind-hearted kind people, yeah. the good acts of people or corporations, organizations that are willing to support you. Yeah. And they're getting nothing back. No. Mate, you've got the hardest job in the world. I genuinely, I genuinely think it. So kudos to you for taking it on because you are fully aware of being involved with Care After Combat, you would be fully aware of that when you, when you decided to do it. You bloody idiot. Yeah, I know, yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> the whole Care After Combat thing, and I think we I don't know, we spoke privately about it. Did we? So, yeah, oh. so so Jim asked me to become a trustee and obviously that never evolved. Or it, it, I went to a few trustee meetings and, and stuff like that, but it never came to fruition. Um, and the decision was made apparently that I was best off placed fundraising, you know, Fine, tell me that. You know, I think it was. Yeah, you know, I'm going to say this because looking back, it's, it's kind of. I, I'm proud of it. Um, you know, ninety thousand in five years, fundraising directly involved with as an events that I organised or co-organised is a lot of money. Um, so they thought best place to see as a fundraiser. Fine, no problem with that. But tell me. Um, but yeah, the, there was changes taking place when I was in the trustees meeting and, and they wanted a new website and stuff. And that's where the, the, fra- the fractures started to appear between me and Jim because they wanted a new website. I was given the responsibility to 
go and source a new source a website. Um, so went to three different companies, blah, 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 and they come back and went. How much detail do you want to go into here? Just, I don't know. I'm just saying, because we have beers. Yeah, I'm yeah, just yeah no, no, fine, because okay. we'll, we'll we've, I say kissed and made up. Me and Jim are talking again now, as in, as in terms of. Well, yeah. he's a decent guy, right? Things I've met fine. him. I've met him once, right. years he, ago. He is a Marmite character. Um, How he knows? Yeah, I so, follow his Twitter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there is, there is. He's never going to win over everyone. He's of an era where he's not going to change. He, he, in the conversation with me, he, he said, "I'm never going to change." You know, um, I am who I am. Fine, um, but I tell you what, you, you cannot. <laughs> You cannot underestimate or, or, or um, you know, t- you know, turn a have a negative opinion on how he has helped veterans from flipping way back, you know, way back, and the amount of his own personal money he's put into a, to charities or fundraising or, you know, um, his own autobiography, all the sales from that went to to go after combat, you know. Um, Why does he do it? Where's the connection, the military connection? Where's that from? He went on Piers Morgan's life stories, isn't he? And I think he's, just, he's always had a, an admiration for, for the forces. Um, and I think, you know, he's... I can't speak for him, but he's of that, that era, you know, Cockney, and he's, he's, he's very proud to be British, isn't he? And generous. And generous. And, yeah. And, he, you know, you know, we had... I don't know him, so... Yeah, I yeah, 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 but, yeah, but we had fallen outs and that, but I've, I've always said... Jim, no matter what we kind of said to each other and that, and, and, and stepping away when I've resigned from Calf to Combat, you know, he gave me the ambassadorship, didn't have to. He's always been good, he's always been, you know, as in, I could email him or phone him or, or whatever. Um, he's always been honest, um, and he's always had the veterans' um, best, fourth, interest, yeah, best interest, yeah, forefront of his, his, and it still is, you know, even now he's, and, and I won't, because it's not been publicised now, but he's, he's still working now. Uh, he's st- he stepped down from CEO of Calf to Combat, but there's something else in, in the pipeline which is going to support veterans, um, which will will come out at some point. So, you know, he doesn't have to do that. He's, but he does, um, and he takes a lot of flack as well. But he's very thick skinned. Um, but I've, I've said, you know, I've got respect for him. Um, I like to think the respect works both way, both ways. But yeah, but it's a good thing is when when we did have the fallen out, as I said, to, you know, you've dealt with armed forces personnel for a long time. So if you thought oh, I was just going to accept what you had to say, then you know. So, but we are we're in we're, in, we're not obviously in, in in contact contact, but he, he you know a few emails here and that, and and when I just got selected for promotion, he was one of the first ones to say you know congratulations, well done. So, Congratulations, well done, Gav. Yeah. What you mean? What? No, I dropped that in, but yeah, but he did. He did. He did get in touch and said, you know, well, and that was after, that was the first time I heard from him since I've fallen out, and that was over twelve months. So, oh, good. So yeah, that's good, mate. So, um, what's the Hidden Warriors website? So, uh, www.hiddenwarriors.co.uk. Good, and you can. So you brought in some. Car- Coffee for me today. I'll give this away to my Patreon supporters. However, if, if you were listening and you like coffee, go to hiddenwarriors.co.uk. They sell coffee and the uh, funds go to support Hidden Warriors and their beneficiary families and kids. Yeah. Wor- I'm, I've got a, a bag of Warrior Blend coffee in my hand. Delicious. I've already got a bag of this, you know, because I bought some already. Did buy, yeah, you did buy yeah, some. I was yeah. like, oh, I'm going to something else now. Yeah, but I, 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 I knocked caffeine on the head three weeks ago. You did but say, yeah. I may relapse. I will. I've not, I've not, ruled, out ca- I've not ruled out coffee the rest of my life. So I've got Hidden Warrior, the rest of that bag waiting for me. We need to have a port as well before we go. Uh... Oh, yes, do it. Yeah. Go on, pour it then. Go. I mean, I've got to get up. Oh, yeah, you go. I've fallen down. No, go pour it. Um, also, while you're... Uh, while y- what are you doing? Hey, thanks to your arms. You could have reached that. Oh, the glasses. Could have reached that. I should have rang a tongue. Uh, the... I noticed you're wearing a DevSoc t-shirt. That is a nice t-shirt. Oh, yeah. Okay. It is a nice t-shirt. Uh, I'll have to. Go. I think I was going to say I have to get one of those. Is that the one where you have to? Well, you know they're sponsored the podcast, didn't you? But you know the you have to. First off, I like the pink, the pink flamingo. I think it's cool. It's different. Uh, what workout did you have to do to earn that t-shirt? Squat City. <laughs> right. <laughs> so on, what's Squat City? Cheers, mate. Cheers. cheers, shipwreck. 
Cheers. So if I remember rightly, it was, um, I think it was, was it 50 squats followed by 10 burpees for 10 rounds. So it's 500, 500 air squats and then uh, 100 burpees. Right, full explain time. the process for me for this. Okay, so in terms of earning that T-shirt, okay, because I do talk about this to start the podcast, but and I love it. I love the concept. Okay, you've actually done it. I haven't done it. So, yeah, I'm jacked. So, so what's the process? So you went onto the website and had a look. I went on the website after hearing it on the podcast. Just always, <laughs> obviously, totally. This isn't a plug of death. Oh, no, 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 I'm no, interested no, and I like the T-shirt. No, um, so yeah, so I didn't know anything about DevSoc until listening to to the podcast. Um, went on there and you said like 500 quid in it. if you want to buy it it's 500 quid yeah that's right so if you go on it that t-shirt you're wearing now is listed on the website right it's listed on the website as 500 pounds correct correct it's a fucking t-shirt yeah I like the t-shirt yeah. but I wouldn't pay 500 pounds for it but go on and then um, with it is a, a an attached workout so if you complete the workout which is a, a squat city with this, this one was squat city I thought it was the easiest one out of all the others at the minute. I'll work up to the others. Um, do it full time, uh, you know, best possible time. Um, send evidence to the email or Instagram. And give you a discount code. How do you send the evidence? What did you have to do? Just, uh, I took a photo of myself with, um, I wrote up on the board, 50 squats, 10 burpees, tick, 10 times. Just a picture of myself with me watch. You know, that's the, that's the evidence. You could just think, go... You gotta be honest about it, yeah. If, if you're gonna say, there will be people who do it though. Oh, I like that t-shirt. I'm just gonna say I did it, um, but um, I know I did it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I thought I'd wear it today because I think when you first said, when you first had him as a sponsor, you said, "Oh yeah, I'm gonna get involved and get, I'll, I'll get involved and do that." But I knew you hadn't. So, <laughs> you <won't>. yeah. <laughs> so I thought, ah. <laughs> So you get in there first. Yeah, get in there first. Can I have that t-shirt? Oh, yeah. Well, I don't think it, that's just a large actually. Just say no. Yeah. I don't want the t-shirt. I'll earn it. <laughs> Fair one, but it's a, it's a one, uh, yeah, and and it's got the state wavy actually on the. It's oh, is it? Uh, oh yeah, nice touch, little label on it saying stay wavy. Uh, I had that one today, yeah, and um, my wife went stay wavy. Like, <laughs> what's that? Um, so yeah, um, but uh, yeah, you know, I've started following on Instagram, and I get the daily waves um, emails, and really like what they're trying to do. And they also said, you know, when I first signed up, they said, oh, hidden warriors tell us more kind of thing. So they've shown an interest in what we kind of do, which is well, good. Well, they're serving. The people behind DevSoc... Are they? Yeah, the, the people behind DevSoc, well, at least one of them is serving. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. And I, obviously I've spoken to them because yeah. they sponsored the podcast. But well, good people, mate. It's like, you know, I, I, as I said to him on the phone, I, I, I could have... I couldn't have anyone I wanted as a sponsor, but I could accept anyone who applied to be a sponsor for the podcast. I don't like to do that. I, like, if, imagine I was, imagine I was pitching DevSoc. Imagine I was pitching, not DevSoc. Imagine I was pitching an organization sponsorship and saying how mega they're and all that. And I didn't think they were mega yeah, or I yeah. didn't know anything about them. I couldn't do that. It'd be a complete disservice to my listeners. Complete disservice. I can't, I can't do it. It's impossible. So like with them, for example, it's like, okay, they're interested in sponsoring. Let's have a conversation. And then I, we had a conversation. I was like, Fucking right. I'm all over this. You mega. Get mega. I love the concept. Like like I said, I love the concept that you have to earn it. You have to earn the earn the apparel. Yeah. Like it's brilliant. It's getting people to be active, getting people to achieve, getting people to do something valuable, and then show off that you achieve. And it's I like I love I like pink. Yeah. Uh, I feel so, <laughs> uh, you know, caveat it as in yes, it was Squat City and you know, do it in the, your best possible time. But if it took me two hours to do it, they, they, they don't care it either. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah, exactly. So that's what, you know, they don't care. Um, you know, I, 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 I like doing fizz. What were the other um, workouts? Oh, there's, there's different. It's one with a rower. I don't like rower machines. Why? But, but it's just... You ain't got the build to be honest. Right, well, like a flipping yeah, well, or a, it, orangutan. You don't go anywhere, do you? <laughs> Did you go anywhere where you were doing air squats? Did you go... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you can change the location. You can like look at a different wall <laughs> <laughs> on a rowie. Just oh, yeah. rowing is it's apparently a good one. It's, it's a good, it's a good feel. But yeah, I've never been much into it. Yeah. Good workout, mate. Oh, my old man used to work. My old man rode for um, my old man rode for England when he was in. I thought he's Welsh. Oh, your mum's Welsh. No, my dad's not English either. 
You're Irish. Dad's Scottish. Oh. My dad's Scottish. My mother's Irish. You're Welsh. I'm Welsh, but my dad went to school in in England. His dad was an actor. My my so my family name on my dad's side was Buggy. Ah, was Buggy, and then my granddad was an actor, and he changed his surname. Do you want Andrew from Andrew Buggy? He changed his surname to Kia ah. after Kia Hardy, I think, to Andrew Kia, and then the family name Kia, yeah. Yeah, my dad's. So that's why my name Hugh isn't Welsh spelt with a W, it's GH. Anyway, how did we get into that? Mate, I, I can feel the alcohol kicking in. We need to wrap this up. Yeah, we can go on and on. Um, <laughs> didn't, didn't touch, didn't touch Things on. get silly. Yeah, we, we didn't, silly we didn't touch on Johnny Mercer. We didn't touch on. Oh, uh, hang on. Well, we do another one. You want to just come on again? Yeah, for three years' time, I'll be 40. <sighs> oh, I'm 40 this mate, year. I'm 40 I fought with your birthday the other day, didn't I? I said, You ain't getting no curly the caterpillar cake from me. No. No, I'm 40 this year. Um, um, right, that's it. Done. Hidden Warriors at Hooded UK. Yep. Uh, uh, Instagram, Hidden Warriors. Twitter, Hidden Warriors UK. Um, or Hidden Warrior UK. And Facebook, Hidden Warriors. Buy coffee. I've got a baseball cap on now. Which, thanks for bringing this in, mate. I like this. Uh-huh. Yeah, I like my baseball caps. I like this. And um, it's been a pleasure. Yep. Absolutely. I've loved it. Good. Been looking forward to we'll it. We'll do it again, mate. Yeah, well, well, it's like you, yeah, it's like you, well, 24 hours. Round three. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In round three, we'll see how, uh, we'll see, because it'll be a while yet, probably. Yeah. Probably. It may not be. We'll see, because um, Johnny Mercer's just resigned, or has he? Anyway, he's out of position as Veterans Minister. And Leo. Doherty. Oh, Leo Doherty's in. Coldstream Guard, ex Coldstream Guard, I think, or he's ex Guardsman. Yeah, he got, he got Scots Guard, maybe. Yeah, he got some grief on social media. Oh, he don't even know four years. Whether well, he did four years or a day or, or doesn't Isn't matter. Yeah, we, yeah. yeah, we'll see. So we'll see, yeah, how, so see what's happening. Anyway, yeah, been a pleasure. Pleasure again. Loved it. Let's, uh, let's go get more beers. You got a meeting. We've got a meeting. I'm, I'm not on the committee. Yeah, but you're on it. Ah. Anyway, cool. Next time. Next see time. you later, people. Cheers. Bye. Thanks.